Hi, y'all. I'm Marty. Hey, Marty. Hey, Marty. I'm a grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon and al and I am grateful to be here this morning. Um, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to take your shoes off because they're bugging me already. I am a member of Al-Anon. Uh, my home group is Reservoir Al-Anon Family Group. We meet Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at Second Press. It's at the corner of uh, Cantrell and 430 in Little Rock. And we also have an electronic component. So if you would like to join us some Wednesday, you're welcome to. Um, the contact information is on the ArkansasAlanon.org website. Um, and if I have the best home group there ever was, and if you don't feel that way about your own home group, you need a new one. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, I did meet Kathy in that meeting, and Terry also, and uh, when they had different times of living in central Arkansas. And that's really the cool thing about how um, recovery works for me, is that I get to meet people all over the state and have friends and have contacts where I can, I can text and say, hey, I'm gonna be in that area, uh, where's a good bark you joined? And everybody knows, so that's, that's one of the perks of, uh, of, of having a wide network of, of um, recovery friends. I call Alipals. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me and for the wonderful gift basket bag with all the goodies in it, the candy and cookies and, and the candle and all the good stuff, I really appreciate that. Um, I know that there's a lot of work that goes into putting together a convention because I, uh, I have worked on a convention committee and there's a lot of behind the scenes nuanced stuff and I um, thank everyone that has been has worked on that now and in the past. Um, I want to take a moment and say um, a special welcome to any newcomers. People that haven't been in recovery for very long this is the best thing you can do for your recovery, is to go to conventions, because you get to mingle and mix with people, and you get to spend time, quality time, like we don't get to do in our meetings. You can sit and visit and chat and get to know people, and, uh, and your recovery is just that. It's yours, and it's very important, and you're worth it. Um, it's a commitment, I know, to get up and get dressed and get here, um, but I'm... I have found in my recovery that these, these are the special moments that I don't forget. It's the times when we went to there and we did this and that and that and that and stuff. You make those memories that are lasting. Um, I will tell, oh, I forgot to give you my al anniversary. I, I came to al and I didn't write the date down. Um, I know it was late August or early September of 2008, so I decided to choose my mom's birthday because she's one of the reasons I'm here. And so um, I have been in al now for 14 years, and I keep coming back. There's always something new to be discovered. Um, I have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor, and I have a service sponsor. And these women are... Um, They hold my hand and help propel me forward without pushing. It's an amazing gift um, that these, these ladies give me their time and energy. And we have fun along the way because uh, my name doesn't rhyme with party for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to say that I am not prompt conference approved material. <laughs> If I share with you something today, and you go to your sponsor and say, I heard a sponsor speaker one time say, blah, 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 and your sponsor says, absolutely not. Listen to your sponsor. <laughs> She's heard your fifth step. I have not. <laughs> um, it's important to follow the guidance of trusted servants, of trusted sponsors and guides and mentors in the program. And it's... Um, it's a relationship that I have built. I didn't jump in to a sponsorship relationship with these ladies. It's built over time. And uh, I, can't, I can't emphasize enough what those relationships have meant to me and continue to mean to me. 
Um, to give you a little insight into the way my mind works, and I would suggest you grab hold of your chair at this time. <laughs> uh, have you ever walked into a classroom or a grocery store or a library or wherever, and you look across the room and you go, hmm, oh, wee, I like the way that looks. Oh my God. I, I, I think I could. I think I could do something with that. <laughs> now, if he would just cut that hair and tuck that shirt in and get those god off crocs off of his feet. <laughs> yes, shave. And um, brush his teeth. Oh. And you know, get them stupid wranglers off and get some Levi's on, because you know, those are easier to unzip. Come on. <laughs> If, you're, if you have ever had those moments, you are like me, you are a potential whisperer. You can see the potential. And then you spend the whole rest of your life trying to get them to live up to that daydream that wasn't a reality in the beginning. If you're laughing, you're relating. Welcome to Al-Anon. The, the, there's a program for you, and there's a program of recovery for you. Um, my first um, actual remembrance of an Alanonic behavior when I, is when I was eight years old. Um, it starts a little before that. When I was, okay, first and foremost, I will tell you that I was born in October of 1964. That makes me 58. And it's also the last time the Razorbacks were national champions in football. <laughs> I was born at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, which is just down the street from War Memorial, where Baylor was playing the University of Arkansas, and my mom decided to go into labor on October the 10th. My dad was the little fish swimming upstream trying to get up Markham to get to the hospital so they could meet me for the first time. Um, my parents came, were, um, came from a rural part of Little Rock by Western Pulaski County. Meager beginnings. We didn't have a lot of money, but I didn't know that growing up. We just did what we did. You know, I thought everybody ate beans three days a week. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Um, <coughs> when my uh, my parents got married in March of 1964, and I was born in October, I believe y'all can do some elementary <laughs> math there and figure out the. The cause for that wedding, and uh, but you know they did love each other, and they had a loving relationship. And um, when I was six, my parents had a second child, and she passed away at six months old. That changed the trajectory of my family, my extend, my my immediate family, and my extended family. Um, it was the first time. In, our, in that generation, they had lost an infant, um, and it was it was devastating, and been spent a lot of time being very sad, though I didn't really understand it because I was just a little kid. But when you're in first, second grade, and the teacher looks at you and goes, <laughs> "Well, I didn't I didn't understand the reason for that poor pitiful look." I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I had done something to deserve this pity. I did not. So in December of 1972, my grandfather passed away. My sister died in April of 71, and my grandfather died in December of 72. I had had a year and a half of sadness, and I was, I was done. I was over it. And so um, my first alanonic uh, behavior appeared that day because it was the first time I had ever seen one of those coffee pots with the spigot, you know, an urn, and I thought that was cool. And so I would run around snatching coffee cups out of people's hands and go and fill it up with coffee. Now, if I took it back to the same person I got it from, I don't know. <laughs> I am not a waitress. <laughs> um, but that was my first, my first remembrance of doing something so I wouldn't have to feel the feelings that were uh, in the moment. And that set up a, uh, 
lifelong pattern of, you know, stinky stuff is going on. I don't want to feel it. I'm going to step it down and get busy, do something else. Um, anytime there is horrible tragedy going on in my house, in my world, in my chaos, my house will be clean. I will take a toothpick and a, and a, tooth, a, a Q-tip to, to the bathroom tub drain. Mm -hmm. Because that is I, that keeps me busy. I feel like I'm accomplishing something and I don't have to spend my energy. I don't have to think about the chaos that's ensued in my life. Um, my mom is my, is my original person whose drinking bothers me. And if you'll notice, I didn't call her a name because she never stood behind the podium and said my name is NIMA. So I don't have that right either. I will tell you, she had quite a few duck-like tendencies. <laughs> and um, she stopped drinking for 10 years from when I was eight until I was 18. And that was probably the hardest years of our, our, my life because she needed a drink. She needed something to take the edge off. Um, it was, she never had a program of recovery. I think if she would have had an opportunity to um, fellowship with members of Alcoholics Anonymous, she may have found an easier, softer way, but she did not. She died in 2013. Um, she weighed 68 pounds. She did not die from alcoholism, but she died from all of the, the symptoms that go with alcoholism. She died of um, untreated COPD because, I don't know if y'all know about this level of denial, but when my mother would go to the doctor, he would listen to her lines and he would say questions like, do you have any trouble going upstairs? And my mother would say, well, no. And my daughter was with her one time when that this um, question was asked, and my grand and my daughter, my daughter got in the car and said, "Mama, why did you tell that doctor you don't have any trouble going upstairs?" She said, "Because I don't go upstairs." Mm. <laughs> okay. There you go. Um, so the my home life trained me to. Um, keep peace at any cost, to be a people pleaser, to try to figure out what you wanted and make sure I had that all lined up before you ever got upset or angry because I knew there would be hell to pay if, um, if I let it get too far. So I needed to, I needed to do the dance to keep you. And that's also probably where some of the humor that I developed came in because I would try to do stuff that would make you laugh so that you would not be upset and angry. Like, if I was ever being disciplined, like, you know, I had done something that was against the rules and my parents were giving me the stern talking to, I would look at them and say, you don't look like you like me anymore. Now, you can't stop help but laugh when kid looks at you and says that. And then, when they would laugh, I would feel relief and they wouldn't be as strict and stern. And so, some might call that manipulation. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I moved out of the house when I was uh, 19 years old because I got married because somebody asked and I said, sure. I don't know that the, there was any ever of that. There was never any of that romantic, you know, um, romance novel type of a, attraction, but he asked, and I said yes, and we had two kids and got divorced. It was great. He wasn't a drinking sort, but he had other issues that were odd. You can read between the lines. And so um, I divorced, and my father passed away in 1996. I got divorced in 1990. I had a 1993 or 94. And... When my dad died, it, it took the wind out of me because he was my marble man. 
He was there to always fix whatever was wrong. I really miss him still to this day. His funeral, his funeral was the largest gathering in the church of the of my my youth and childhood. And my great my grandmother, my mom's mom, always had a quick word and quick wit. And uh, the guy that preached my dad's funeral was a lay preacher, meaning he wasn't a, a preacher for money. He just was a, a guy that preached for free and for, and for fun and for free. What a job. <laughs> and um, my grandmother went up to the regular preacher of the, past, at, of the church afterwards and said, isn't it a shame there's a full house and you didn't get to preach? <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of um, wit and wisdom that was uh, granted to me from my family of origin, so I come by it naturally and honestly. <clears throat> After my father had passed away, I had spent a few years just trying to get my feet under me, and then in 1999, the lady I work with said, I know this guy that you'd probably like. And I said, I just, I'm not interested because I just want a normal guy and I can't find any. <laughs> well, you know what I found. <laughs> yes, you do. So in 99, Tim and I went on our first date. Um, we got married in 01. We got divorced in, we separated in 08, got divorced in 09, and got back to, together in 10. Because I, had been around, um, I had been around recovery. I had been on the fringes of recovery for a long time because I worked for a gentleman who's like 40 something years sober now. And he, he would drop the little breadcrumbs of uh, recovery information to me and he had suggested that I go to Al-Anon repetitively. <laughs> and um, I guess he could see some character traits that were familiar to him, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but I had heard that um, where this one particular group was, and the, I had heard that if you join and you get a sponsor and start working the steps, you can't make any big decisions or big changes for a year. So I kicked him out and went down on him. <laughs> because I'm a rule follower. <laughs> Okay, then there's that. So I uh, I joined Al Anon, and I I went the first meeting I went to. It was real fluff, and it was real a lot of pious Patty Perfects in there going, "Oh hello, I'm so grateful to be married to an alcoholic." And I thought, "What is wrong with you? <laughs> Do you have some sort of illness? Do you need a, you might need an eval, ma'am." Um, <laughs> Because I just didn't, I didn't get the connection. I didn't get that you could be happy uh, whether they're drinking or not. I, that was such a foreign thought to me. And um, so I went to that meeting for a little while and I, I, met a, I ran into a lady there that was um, the mother of my uh, friend, of my, of my daughter's friend. And she, I said to her, I said, is this, is this as good as it gets? And she said, you ought to try the group I go to, my home group. And I said, where's that? And so she told me, and so I did. I tried it. And it fit great for a couple of years. Oh, I had a sponsor at that first meeting I was telling you about. And just like that meeting, it was, it was a little fluff. Because um, I'm fairly good. I mean, I've honed my skills as a master manipulator over my entire life. So by the... I was working with this alleged sponsor, and by the time we got to the ninth step, I didn't have anybody to make amends to. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought maybe there was something wrong with the way this was going. Because I had heard stories, what y'all had said in those meetings, and I wasn't having the same experience. So I, um, I stopped going to that meeting, and I stopped using that sponsor, and I went to this other meeting. And I got a different sponsor. And turns out, I did have a few amends to make. But I did that, I went through that process. And that second sponsor began to be a little constricting, a little, um, a 
the, it was kind of like Goldilocks and the porridge. One was too hot and one was too cold and one was just right. Well, that second one was, just didn't quite work out either. So I found another group and I found another, another sponsor. And here's what I want you to hear when I say that. If, what you're, if you're going to meetings and you feel like, meh, whatever, I'm going to get a lot out of this. Go to a different meeting. Listen to new people. And don't tell me, it's, oh, I live in Jonesboro. There's only one meeting. <clears throat> Here's the internet. There's a World Wide Web with Zoom. You can go to meetings anywhere, anytime. That's one thing the pandemic did. It took the rails off, it took the side rails off. We have, we have access to meetings <laughs> all over the world. And I went to a meeting um, last Wednesday night in Oregon, and it was fabulous. And I, see, I, I, I say that because I want you to know that your recovery is worth your time and your effort and your desire. And if you, if you go to, a, if you come to al and you think, ah, oh, there might be something there, I'm not quite sure, keep fishing. Keep throwing your baited hook in the water. You will catch what you need to catch when it's the right time. And that's, that's what I have discovered because that first meeting I went to, it gave me enough uh, relief. And that second meeting I went to, it gave me some hope. And this third meeting I gave, that I've been going to, it became my home. And, and I'm home every Wednesday night every Wednesday night. I have to be actively bleeding, half fever or vomiting to not go. <laughs> That's a commitment that I've made to myself, not to, not to the people at the meeting. They're there, they're great, they're ancillary to the reason I'm there. I'm there for my recovery from the family disease of alcoholism because there's no reprieve. Because I can tell you to this day I will be standing in the grocery store line in the express checkout counting the number of items in the cart of the person in front of me. <laughs> Can you people count? <laughs> oh, I digress. Um, uh, I did make, I did want to make an addition to, uh, and I have permitted Tim's permission to share this. Um, Tim, made a run at sobriety in 2005. And he made several other runs at sobriety over the years. He has, in, and then in um, July of 2020, he finally found a home group that worked for him. And he's been, so, 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 he's been sober since July of 2020. Yeah. I won. <laughs> and I say that with all the sincerity because on July 14th of 2020, I looked at him and he, I mean, we're in the midst of the drips of the pandemic and there was a lot of fear and unrest and, and he was really, really, really suffering from the disease of alcoholism. He, he, was, in the, he was in the deep depth grips of it. And, and he looked at me and he said, I don't know what to do. And I said, go to AA, <laughs> like the devil I am. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> green piece of an old bit. Because I knew that y'all had something that would work. I couldn't do it for him. I'm a terrible treatment center. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have the qualifications at all. But I knew y'all had a solution and that you would share with him if he asked. And um, I'll tell you how he finally found sobriety, and this is this is how this is how having a uh, wide network of friends in the program really helps out. So I went to dinner with a friend, and she said, "Tim might need the table group," and I said, "What's that?" Now I've been in around the program 12, 13 years. So I've never heard of this, and she said, "It's kind of an intensive AA program," <laughs> and I said. Okay, and so I was then talking to my, another mentor friend of mine who lives in Fayetteville, and I said, a friend of mine mentioned something about a group called the Table Group. Have you ever heard of that? And she said, 
oh yeah, I know somebody that's a member of that. And I said, really? Would you give me his phone number? She said, sure. She texted me his contact info. I texted his contact info to Tim and said, you might need to call that guy. Now, I understand anonymity and why it's important, but if a group is so anonymous that it takes somebody in North Little Rock telling me somebody in Little Rock to mention it to somebody in Fayetteville that knows somebody in Alexander to get somebody into a meeting in downtown Little Rock, maybe that's a little too anonymous. Just think about it. That's all I'm saying. Think about it. Um, but he uh, has found sobriety, and he's got a, a group of men that he can work with and relate to, and it has, uh, it's just been an awesome transformation. It's incredible. I, it's, I'm, I can't thank AA enough. This can't thank you enough for giving me back the guy, pretty much. <laughs> you know, relationships, whether we're in our disease or in our recovery, they're pretty much a little bit tricky. But the truth is, I probably should have learned everything I ever needed to know about relationships from when I was a kid and I played with some magnets. Y'all ever seen two magnets when they get together? When you get them kind of close, they stick. And they, they, you kissed about, can't get them apart. Well, that was like us when we were prior to recovery. But if one of those magnets pulls the loose and turns over, why well, do you just about can't get them back together again? One's always trying to buck and be, go sideways and not get back together again. So this was like when Tim was still drinking and I was in recovery. We kept trying to stay together, but he was wasn't working good. Now that he's turned over, the magnet's back together again. It ain't quite perfect, but it works a whole lot better when we're both trying to pedal the uh, bus in the same direction. Um, the, the best thing I ever did um, for our relationship was to get recovery and to get to focus on myself. Um, I will never be, um, I, I'm not an alcoholic and I can't help alcoholics, but I can help the family members. Um, I do have experience, strength, and hope in that, that's for sure. Um, when I, when I talk about um, sponsors and service sponsors, it's the reason that I needed a service sponsor is because I got into service in Al-Anon. And uh, like any good al person, I got into service um, because somebody annoyed me. <laughs> somebody changed something about uh, the way we did our um, opening and closing in our home group. And it annoyed me. And so a couple of months later, they, we were holding elections for GRs. And then and they said, would you like to be GR? And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pick me. <laughs> they picked me, and I changed it back. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that will get you into service like an annoyance. <laughs> um, but what the, what the cool thing about that was was that I got to expand my um, my base, expand my friendship base. Because I started, I didn't, I didn't research that whole GR thing very good because then I found out I had to go to area assembly. <laughs> and I, uh, but I began to, I went to area assembly and um, I sat next to a lady and the only lady I knew there. And um, about halfway through that first day, I leaned over and said, uh, are these people special needs? <laughs> she said, everybody gets to have their say. And I said, over and over again? <laughs> she said, yeah, pretty much. You're okay. I know. I know, but I kept going back because apparently I'm one of them. <laughs> I, um... I, I didn't fall in love with the process of area assembly, but I fell in love with the people. And I met um, 
individuals that had what I wanted. Um, I met past delegates and um, trusted servants that um, were authentic and full of grace and wit and charm and were comfortable in their own sin skin just as is. No change is necessary. And I thought, I like that. I'm attracted to that. And the lady that was area chair, the um, when I was GR, um, she had a way of commanding the room without being authoritative or aggressive. And I thought that was a, that was interesting. How just her presence would was enough to bring. Um, quiet to the chaos and that was interesting to me because I'd not seen that I didn't see that in like the church I was growing up in I mean the po the preacher when he'd get up he'd go to screaming and yelling and his veins would poke out and his face would turn purple and I thought any minute he was going to stroke out and we was going to get to watch him writhe on the floor and <laughs> Unfortunately, that did not happen. Or fortunately, I don't know which one. <laughs> Whoops, Freudian Freudian. <laughs> Um But I, I liked the way that I could watch this lady um, navigate choppy waters when people were having um, um, almost confrontational conversation. But it could be guided in a way that it was um, clear communication. And I thought that was really attractive and interesting. So my term for GR was up, and um, about a year before that, another friend of mine was on the convention committee, um, and I really liked his style. He was, an, he was an interesting guy. And so I said, I'm gonna do that. So I volunteered, and I didn't have any business volunteering for this. Look, I hadn't been in the program five years. But here I am volunteering, because you know, I wanna be a part of. And so I got on the convention committee. Well, see, that's a five-year gig in uh, the way that the Arkansas Island on State Convention Committee worked. And so that did, the timing didn't work out good. And I thought, well, and now if I'm going to have to be here for these meetings anyway, I might as well go ahead and be a DR and get that over with. Because, you know, I can kill two birds with one stone. I'm, very, I'm multitasking a maniac. I can handle it. So I did. I, I, when it came time for the district business meeting, they said, anybody want to be a DR? Whoop, pick me. And uh, they elected me, I, and I did the little hitches DR. And uh, then I stayed on the convention committee. Well, um, there's a, I want to share a little bit with you about my time on the convention committee. Um, if you haven't been of service like that, I see I so recommend it because it's not it's about getting the name badges made and the registrations mailed out and the flyers printed and it is about all that mm -hmm. but what it's really about is learning how to communicate with people on a committee how to assert yourself in appropriate ways on a committee when you can say um, I want I need help with this does anyone know how to do this and somebody says yeah I'll help you with that or, you know, um, I, I watched an a, a interchange between two people at a com at, at convention that was just a moment for me. Two of them, I'll tell you this story. So there was a guy that was in charge of the hospitality room, and um, at, during um, the, the speaker, the hospitality room was closed, and they had those coffee urns, and you know, the uh, coffee would go up in this little glass tube, and the folks, so the first cup that comes out is kind of lukewarm, barely room temperature. So, but you pour the second cup, and it's out of the urn, and it's hot. Well, so this guy goes, and he pours a cup of coffee, gets a drink, and he says, <laughs> to the person that is in charge of the hospitality room. And the person at the hospitality room just stood there very calmly, didn't react to 
that negative energy that was coming at him, and I thought, really? How can we done? <laughs> no. And, um, and he, at the end of that, they all going, rah, rah, about the coffee, he said, I'll get it taken care of. End of conversation. Well, about 20 minutes later, I'm walking by over there, and Mr. Rah, rah, rah came back over to him and said, I need to make amends. I didn't realize that we needed to get the second cup to get the hot coffee. And I was like, oh. really? This recovery crap is for real. I mean, it really works. If you work it, who knew? I didn't. I did not, that's, that was not my experience in my family of origin, okay? Um, and another, I'll tell you an, another story that um, Kathy and I were on the convention committee together, and we had um, separate jobs for the weekend. But there was a late week, she and I both noticed this lady that came into the convention on Friday night. And this lady was... She was sullen, she was upset, she was angry, she was not happy to be there. She had her arms crossed, her legs crossed, her face was a scowl. And that was Friday night. And then after the speaker on Friday night, you could see her just kind of relax a little bit. And then Saturday morning, after another speaker, she kind of, she had a little bit of a little relaxed tone. <coughs> And by Sunday morning at the end of the convention, she was smiling, she was hugging people, and she was fully integrated. She had been exposed to the sunlight of the spirit that comes through these, through the people that I like to call gods with skin on. The people that get up there and share their experience, strength, and hope, and how they overcame tumultuous times in their life and came out okay. You know, it might smell like smoke, but you've been through the fire. And you're doing all right. And I'll never, I don't know that lady's name. I don't know where she was from. I don't think I've ever seen her again. But it was literally like she was a flower that bloomed that weekend. And it was that moment that I realized it ain't about putting stickers on flyers. It ain't about uh, creating Gmail email lists. It's about the connections. And that's something I could have never learned if I hadn't been of service. And when somebody said, hey, you want to be on the committee? Say, yeah. Stick your hand up. Yeah, I'll do it. Those are the things, those are the, those are the things that I couldn't have learned any other way. Um, the year 2018, I was to be the chair for the al Anon State Convention. And I'm gonna tell you what, I was more excited than a kid on Christmas. I was so looking forward. I had picked um, a bunch of speakers that I was really excited to hear their stories. Some of them I had heard and some of them I had not. I had just chosen them because of more recommendations from others. And I tell you, I was so excited until there was a um, massive rain in western Arkansas in the month of February. And um, the watershed goes right through the Washita Mountains, right down the Washita River, which feeds um, Lake DeGray and it flooded. And Lake DeGray is on a, um, the lodge is on a peninsula that became an island. Wow. We had to cancel the convention. It was the first time, it was going to be the 48th annual Al-Anon Convention, and it was the first time in 48 years it had ever been canceled. I developed a, a uh, reputation from that experience. <laughs> <laughs> because I developed a reputation, uh, uh, <laughs> a reputation, because a couple years later, um, in the July of 19, um, a good friend of mine uh, was to be the chair for the 2020 Al-Anon State Convention. It's to be in March. I don't know if y'all remember March of 20. <laughs> <laughs> but my friend <clears throat> had developed cancer and she didn't feel like she could fulfill her duties. And she asked me if I would um, finish out her duty, her time as chair. And I said, sure. And... <laughs> 
So in uh, March of 20, guess what I got to do one more time? I had to cancel that convention because of COVID. We had to just plain cancel it that year because we could not, um, we didn't have the ability to get the electronic function up and running in, in, th in two days time. But I'll tell you some of the little um, side notes that the looking back, what my higher power speaker prints were. Um, in, when I was on publicity chair, um, we, what we set up an email tree to be able to email flyers out. So when it came time to cancel the convention, both times, the email tree was already set up. All we had to do was compose an email and hit send. Everybody was notified in minutes minutes. I couldn't have controlled and manipulated situations, uh, situations to make that happen. Not on my own. That had to be my higher powers work. Um, usually <clears throat> on conventions they have people flying in and it just so happened that all the people that I chose to be speakers that year were going to be driving. They were from like Baton Rouge and Texas and Dallas and, and Oklahoma, uh, Bartlesville. They were close enough that they could drive. So we didn't lose any money on airplane tickets that we couldn't use. I couldn't, like one more time, God had gone before me and planned that out. I couldn't have, I couldn't have managed and manipulated circumstances that, easy, that well. The uh, only money we lost on that convention because the hotel didn't charge us anything because they had closed because it was an act of God, was the, about $180 on the flyers that we had printed. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. And it's amazing how, when I look back, I can see those times when my higher power was managing and, and directing me, even though I didn't have a clue. I didn't know. And that, that carries forward in a... October of 2019, we had I had finished my hitch as the um, DR and as the convention chair, and we were having elections. And so I was finishing my year as DR, and they said, uh, "Okay, you're eligible to stand for area officer position." And I said, "Okay." And they said, what do you want to stand for? And I said, I don't know, God's will, whatever, I don't care. And so I was elected area chair. And the way they do, it's a secret of ballot, and so they have you walk back into the room and they say, you know, congratulations, Marty, you're the next area chair. And the very first thing that came to my mind was, what have you people done? I am not ready. But... My higher power knew, he knew. Because in June of 2019, my work changed and I had to learn how to, I, I learned how to do Zoom to have business meetings to like, get training on this new stuff at work. Well, guess what came in real handy in March of 20? Zoom. We had one area assembly, one IWSC in person, and one area assembly in person in uh, January and February of 2020. And from then, the rest of it was pretty much Zoom. And my higher power had already had trained me on how to use Zoom. Again, I cannot manage and control my circumstances well enough to make these, these things happen. This is, this is what my higher power does. He fixes stuff for me. I don't even know it. I didn't know it was broken, and he fixed it. Um, a lot of the gifts that came through my time as area chairperson, if you haven't been a, had an opportunity to be of service at that level, I highly suggest you at least give it a try. You know, it's, I learned so much about myself, about my abilities, <coughs> what I like and what I don't like, and how to um, simply be. When, when someone has a, a comment to make and I disagree with it, hmm, thank you for sharing. And I mean that. 
I don't have to have an opinion on your opinion. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That is new behavior for Mawa, I can tell you. Um, so I'm going to tell you a couple of uh, most recent stories and then I'm going to wrap up. So I have two children. Um, my youngest daughter was pregnant and she was due the day before yesterday. However, she went into, she had preeclampsia and she had um, my granddaughter 12 weeks early at 28 weeks gestation on August the 19th. She weighed one pound and 13 ounces. She was doing fairly well at UAMS until she contracted RSV and they had to transfer her to Children's and put her on a heart-lung bypass machine. She was intubated and on dialysis. She was on um, fentanyl, morphine, and Dilaudid, and um, Presidex, which is an anti-anxiety med. She had a stroke while on the ECMO machine, and they said that if the bleeding continued or worsened, they would have to take her off ECMO. And because her lungs were in such bad shape, um, she would probably make it about an hour. So, I, I did what I do, I got busy. I had called a friend of mine that is a funeral director, told him what was going on, told him I needed him to be on standby. I, my oldest daughter and I sat in the atrium at the children's hospital while they were doing the CT to see if the bleeding had continued, gotten worse. We planned the funeral. We figured out the um, eulogy, the obituary, the flowers, where it would be, when it would be, and how we would let everyone know. We planned. Thank God we did not have to execute any of those plans. Because my higher power was in charge. He planned the outcome. She did not have any additional bleeding. She came off ECMO, she came off dialysis, she came off the ventilator. She's still on the lauded because when they started trying to ramp her down, she started having DTs. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced DTs as adults, but to watch it in a, in a four and a half pound baby, <coughs> it, it, it'll break your heart in two pieces. Fortunately, she's very scrappy. And she's six pounds and one ounce today, and she's 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 doing it very well. She's coming off of the meds, and she's coming off of the the, the nasal cannula, and she's doing great. One day, this is <coughs> one miracle at a time. I'll tell you that every time I walked into that NICU, the first two when she was on ECMO, there were between between two and five healthcare professionals standing at her bedside. There was a person running the ECMO machine, a person checking on the ventilator, a person checking on um, this, that, something else, and another thing. And all of these people had alphabet soup after their name. Again, my higher power had all those people going to college, studying, making good grades, so that they could be there to take care of my granddaughter. I couldn't manage and manipulate that. There's no way I'm, I couldn't figure that out, but my higher power did. It's amazing to watch those people work. The day my granddaughter got extubated, when she came off of the ventilator, I got to be there to watch that. There was seven medical professionals standing there. And one, I guess, was the respiratory doctor, or the pulmonologist. And he was, I don't know, not that tall. Mm -hmm. He's standing in the back of the room with his hands behind his back. He's just watching. And he said, <coughs> and two people went running. One went over to the computer as fast as they could. 
And another person took off running down the hall because she needed a, a nebulizer treatment, albuterol. And they didn't have any there. And, and just that fast, there was a person literally running down the hallway of that NICU with albuterol. <laughs> just that fast. That's how my higher power works. Just like that doctor said, rrr, rrr. my higher power says, rrr, rrr. Mm. and my life fixes. It's fixed just that fast. People come running. When I, when I, when my daughter was diagnosed as preeclampsia and gained 50 pounds in 15 days of water, and her heart was being affected, I sent a text in the mornings to some of my ally pals, and I said, I need help. Nine minutes later, nine minutes, a friend of mine texted and said, do you have time to talk? She had, was a retired labor delivery nurse. She'd been a midwife for 40 years. She walked me through every single thing that was happening to my daughter. All, she explained every one of those medical terms and all of the, she explained every single thing. I had known this lady for probably 10 years. I never knew what she was retired from. And literally, area assembly, she sat right there. God had her beside me the whole time. Now, if you want some of these miracle stories of your very own, here's how you do it. You get you a sponsor, you work your steps, and if your home group ain't working for you, get you a new one. If your sponsor ain't working for you, get you a new one because you're worth it. You're a recovery from the, fam the effects of a family disease of alcoholism, you're worth it. God loves you that much. He, he invented this whole program just for me. Oh, and y'all too, but, <laughs> but seriously, for me. That's pretty cool. And here's another little sidebar I want to say. You're not too old. You're not too old. Lois Wilson was 61 years old when she started the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon and al -Atain. You are not too old. You can do it. You are worth it. Okay, I've preached long enough. I'm going to close now with my favorite reading, which is what we do in al -Anon. We read stuff. We are educator, educatable. It's on page 360 in Hope for Today. And this, it, this is this is a thumbnail synopsis of what Al-Anon means to me. Serenity is a way of life absorbed slowly and practiced one day at a time. Perspective, becoming aware and accepting and accepting my characteristics and not judging what's bad or good, but what's useful to keep and what to release. A spiritual journey without a destination. The space between the impulse and the action. Accepting what is. Honoring my feelings without aiming them at someone else. Or letting them run my life. A gift I choose to give myself. Knowing that what works for someone else may not necessarily work for me. And knowing what works for me may change from moment to moment. Understanding I may be powerless, but I am not helpless. Realizing my higher power does for me what I cannot do for myself. Minding my own business. The comfort of knowing I can hold my own hand. Balance and relief from black and white thinking. Understanding that reacting to life and responding to life are not the same thing. Deliberate realignment with my higher power. Feeling at peace with my past. A matter of internal stability. 
becoming a complete being with my mind and body in the same place at the same time. Becoming one with my higher power. And I'm going to close with uh, something I saw an AA speaker do at winter holiday in January of 20, just before um, just before the world shut down. Yeah. He um, he asked everyone if they would please whisper the Serenity Prayer, because when I hear when I think of a whisper, I think my higher power leans in close to listen. So if everyone would, let's say the serenity prayer in a whisper together. God, grant me the serenity to do accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for letting me share.